Welcome to CNET Book Club, the show where we talk about books of interest to CNET readers. I'm Dan Ackerman, and with my co-host Scott Stein, we're pleased to bring you this conversation with one of our favorite authors, Walter Mosley. Best known for his hard-boiled detective fiction, we also love his science fiction and speculative fiction, but we're here also to talk about his new book, Down the River, Unto the Sea. The great Walter Mosley is here with us, his new book, Down the River, Unto the Sea. Maybe we can start and you can tell us just a little bit about this new book, maybe the first in a new series. It might be the first in a new series. Who knows? I mean, I, I wrote this book. It's interesting. The last couple of years, I've been really kind of concentrating on doing uh, film work. Like I was going to, I, I was been working with John Singleton on this new this show of his. It's been out for a year, uh, Snowfall. And I've, I've been doing, you know, trying to sell some stuff. I have a deal with uh, NBC trying to to create some series there. And and so, you know, and, and it's fun to do do film, except for it, sometimes it gets a little, like, not boring, but it's like, a, like I'm, I'm not enjoying this. And so I, just, I started to write this novel. And I wrote this novel for a very specific reason. There are uh, uh, black men and, and some women are around the country who are being oppressed all the time by the police. Among that large group, group of people, there's a few people who actually push back. They organize, they become journalists, uh, they get other people to, to, to resist. And the police really kind of hate it because it puts them uh, in a bad position. And so often there's a conflict between these guys and the police. And sometimes people get killed. And sometimes it's the police that get killed. And sometimes it's self-defense on the part of, of these guys over here. But if you kill a cop, then you're definitely going to be sentenced to death if they can, if the law can do it. And so, you know, it happened in Philly uh, with Mumia, it happened in Baltimore with Eddie Conway, uh, but it's, it's all over the place. And so uh, I wanted to write a book about a guy, a black guy who's used to be a detective, but has been disgraced there. And he's not, and now, and now he's a private detective and, he, and he, he's been hired to, to, to prove whether or not this guy, another black guy has killed these two cops and he's on death row. Now, he doesn't like the guy because, you know, he identifies as a policeman, but uh, he decides to, to look into it. And at the end, he proves a couple of things. One, he proves his innocence from a previous time, but nobody wants to listen. And he also proves that this guy is innocent. And they say that might very well be, but we're still going to kill him. That's right, because nobody cares that yeah. he's innocent. It's the narrative that they've set up. Well, so uh, it and it parallels with yeah. his own case. Yeah. Um, what... What drove you to turn this into a new series rather than, let's say, assigning it to one of your other characters? Was there something new you wanted, some new angle you wanted to tackle that Leonid McGill or Easy Rollins couldn't couldn't have couldn't have done with this with this case? Well, that is true, but part of the situation was this: I I wanted to write. I was just writing a book. I hadn't sold it. I hadn't brought it to anybody. I didn't know if I was going to sell it, but I was just going to write it. And so, if I had to do it with one of my char characters, Fearless Jones, Easy Rollins, you know, Leonid McGill. I would have to actually think about it. Like, okay, who is he? What is, okay, what did the easy do in the last book? Okay, what are the other characters doing? And I didn't want all that. Uh, I, and, and I needed him to be a policeman because a policeman trying to prove somebody who killed a policeman is innocent. That's a hard, that's a hard jump for him. And when, so, so you can feel his resistance to it while he's, he's moving along. He's almost the only person who could do that, having been a cop. Yeah, well, you know, and once he's done it, we really believe him because, you know, he's, he's saying, look, I, I'm, I'm looking at the evidence here. He didn't do it. And he still you thinks know? of himself as a cop all these years later. Yes. You know, even though the other cops may not. Yeah, well, some cops do, some, some cops some do. Some yeah, don't. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that it's set in New York. Uh, I always thought of you uh, as, a, as a Los Angeles writer, and you created such a vivid picture of Los Angeles for me as only an occasional visitor, Scott actually used to live in LA. Yeah, I was in LA for about, well, so it's Southern California for about eight years. So it's a different energy. What part it's, of LA did you live in? So I lived in the Valley. I lived in, in Sherman Oaks. Yeah. And uh -huh. I had friends who were in Los Feliz. And then I was in San Diego for a bunch of years, but I would always travel up there uh -huh. and used to work down in West Hollywood. So we'd travel up through, through uh, Mulholland Drive yeah. area and yeah. through there, Coldwater Canyon. But yeah, got to explore as much as I could. Yeah, and I would only be in Los Angeles you know, a couple of times a year, but reading the first, you know, half dozen, six or seven Easy Rollins books, I really felt like this reflected even what I had seen during mm -hmm. my, you know, couple of times a year trips. It, it, was, it was such a great, vivid portrait. So when I started reading the Leonid McGill books, and they were set in New York, I was 
very excited about that. I, this is, I'm a native New Yorker, mm -hmm. it's very familiar to me. And then when I saw this was set in Brooklyn, where I now live, mm -hmm. uh, not that far from, from where I live, I was like, oh, the guy's office is on Montague Street, this is great. Yeah. And you start talking about the issues of, of gentrification and changing neighborhoods. Uh, as someone who ended up in Brooklyn because I was gentrified out of my old neighborhood. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, 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 saw, I saw all that. Uh, and I was very interested in kind of New York as a character uh, and how that feels to you compared to, let's say, Los Angeles as a character. Well, that's, that's, that's an interesting. New York is, is much, much, much older and more conservative. Uh, which is, you know, both good and bad. Los Angeles is, is sprawling and, and always growing. It's kind of like a cancer that won't die, you know, and it's just, it's just you know, all over the place. And, and, that's, and, and so, you know, you talk about it in different ways. In New York, there are very, a lot of things which you can believe, like when, you know, when, uh, you know, uh, Joe, Joe Oliver goes uh, uh, to, to, to some, you know, apartment somewhere and there's a door and it leads underneath and there's this, you know, giant speakeasy underneath. That's kind of understandable in New York. It's not understandable in L.A., but in New York, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that you can do because there are people who've been there forever. There have been people who've been there since before America, you know, it was the United States, you know, that, that that's the kind of thing that, that, that you do. But also it's, uh, but the other part of it is just knowing it, just, you know, walking the streets, taking the subway, you know, taking buses, taxis, talking to people, you know, and, and you see that, you know, one of the things is LA is segregated by class and in New York, all classes are kind of shoved together, you know. Is there something thing. particularly interesting about Brooklyn, which is sort of, I guess, over the last 10 years become a brand and just become like one of these places that everyone on the, in the world talks about? Mm. Well, no, I, I just, you know, I, I, you know, listen, I, the same thing happened with you. Uh, nine years ago, uh, they, when they raised my rent to $6,500 a month, I said, oh, I have to move away. So I went to, you know, to Brooklyn and, you know, then I found myself in Brooklyn. And I don't even know what the old Brooklyn was like because the new Brooklyn has, has just like, like kind of appeared, oh, yeah. uh, you, you know, spontaneously. And, uh, but you know, it's a lot of fun, you know. I can't even afford new Brooklyn. I went out to New Jersey. Oh, I can't either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I can't even afford yeah. New Jersey, really. I feel yeah. like, yeah, we have to move to another part of New Jersey. I, I, I have Connecticut. To, yeah, yeah, Connecticut. Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut. <laughs> Affordable Connecticut. Hey, I had to move up. I, I grew up in the Bronx. I eventually achieved my dream of moving to Manhattan. Then I got bumped to Brooklyn, but I feel like it's it's kind of caught up, and it's yeah. But everybody else now. got bumped to Brooklyn, so yeah. so, so uh, Manhattan is. We've all we've all gone there. Yeah, I don't know yeah. anyone who still lives in Manhattan. Well, my vector, like what what I discovered, you as a writer was through science fiction, yeah. and that that's I mean that's what we talk about a lot here. And and a book that I fell in love with was Futureland, and I didn't read it when it first came out in two thousand one. I read it when it uh, about six seven years ago. And uh, and it it is still lingered with me. I love it for the way that it was disruptive, it was disturbing. When I saw things like Black Mirror later, I kept thinking about Futureland. Hmm. You know, I felt, hmm. I, I, and it made me think about. Uh, and then I started reading interviews and referring to Philip Dick, and I was thinking about that when I was reading it in a really in a really good way. I I just was fascinated about the existence of that book. What 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 drove you to write it? Um, and it's still so timely now because we were saying a lot of the uh, a lot of the issues in it, uh, class and race, the the technology, some of the the surveillance issues. You even get into things like like um, like like Nazism and 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 different social groups. There's this feminist issues. There's all sorts of things that I feel like we're talking about now at this mm. moment mm. more than when I read it uh, six years ago. And so I, I was curious what your thoughts on the book were now versus then and. And so, what, what drove you to write? For me, it was very, very interesting. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so long ago, you know, that those nine stories that kind of try to encapsulate a future world. One of the things that, you know, like being black and coming to um, science fiction, you, you do things like you're watching Star Wars, which has a much larger uh, influence than, for instance, Star Trek, which is just wonderful. But Star Wars in, in Star Wars, they're just aren't any people of color who aren't like aliens or stupid. And, and so, and, and because, you know, coming out of Jules Verne, um, Jules Verne invented the next century. He did in those books. He just invented it. So oh, we're going to have some submarines and we're going to go to the moon and then we're going to have these flying things, and, you know, the, the, the atomic energy. And he just had all this stuff. He was doing it. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking, God, these movies are trying to create a future in which there are no black people. There are no people of color. I'm going to go into a future, not like going to the future of Moby Dick, where there are, but but going into Hawthorne, you know, Scarlet Letter, where there aren't. That we just don't, we aren't there. 
And so I wanted to write a, a book that, that included us in, in a real and also in a political way. That, that there are people of all kinds of colors and races and also in gender who are like, you know, uh, wonderful and powerful. I, I, I um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm working now with Forrest Whitaker. Uh, Forrest wants to, 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 to play in the first, if we do a, a television series of the first season of he wants to play the electric guy, which would be great. You know, oh, it'd be fantastic. He's an incredible actor. And, you know, he likes that kind of stuff. And, 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 but that's it. I'm, I'm trying to create a future that I, that I see comes from a trajectory that I'm starting from rather than some other guy. You know, I like Harrison Ford and everything, but you know, please, you know, I have to be like him. Well, I thought it was also, it's very kaleidoscopic in the way it deals with, I think, race and culture in, in those nine stories that it's coming from a lot of different directions, a lot of different positions. Yeah. And, and then it keep, and then the elements keep resurfacing. It's not really separate stories at all. It's a novel in, mm -hmm. in nine chapters right. that, yeah. that all intertwine. So I thought that was, that was really exciting. I mean, it, the thing needs to get made because I, it made me think about anthology shows now. And there's so many of those now. And there's so many built in that form. There were Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams or, again, That Black feels Mirror. a lot like it. Obviously, Black Mirror feels a lot yeah. like it. Uh, but this predated all of those. And even so many of the things yeah. that we were talking about, private prisons. Uh, there's a lot of issues about access to health care and health insurance. Uh, megalomaniacal billionaires who want to send people to Mars. And we actually have one of those now. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk wants mm -hmm. to go to Mars. Uh, and if anyone would buy their own island and set up their own government, it's probably him. Although we have plenty of other billionaires with uh, mm -hmm. similar delusions of grandeur. Uh, and then some of the stuff about, um, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the mechanical eye that feels like a wearable. Scott has uh, written extensively about things like the Microsoft HoloLens, which is a pair of glasses you put on that has this overlay with all this data on it. Or what's the other one that's like that? Google Those Glass. HoloLens, yeah, there's a promise of what Magic Leap is going to bring mm -hmm. in. And, and, you, and the fears to, of it. When you go, yeah. uh, for me, you know, because I really often I'm like giving readings and people say, you know, who influenced you? And they want me to say Dostoevsky and Shakespeare and Ralph Ellison, you know, instead of the people, you know, who, who really like influenced me, like Jack Kirby, you know, who's, you know, when he does the new gods in the mother box, that mother box is just like, it's outrageous. Like, I like the, you know, the, the, Ju the Justice League, you know, that movie has the mother box in it, but it's not, you know, you wore it on your shoulder. It talked to you. It yeah. took care of you. It fixed you in your bed. It was actually some, something in the future that people would want, you know, uh, and, but maybe shouldn't have. And, 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 and that's, you know, that's, you know, the, the electric eye was, was certainly that. I'm not talking about Farrah Jones, the first legitimate female uh, intergender heavyweight mm -hmm. champion of the world, you know. I mean, really, to have that kind of stuff, you know, it, it sounds so crazy right now, but it's not going to be. You know, when you, you, you talk about, you know, the, the radical lesbian feminist separatists, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that are part of creating her life. You know, and and you just kind of like, wow, this is this is such a this is such a kind of a crazy and and it's it's it there's a there's a scent to it. You know, it's not it's not science fiction like you know like you know two thousand one. I love two thousand one, but you know, it's not like oh, it's just neat halls and no dust and everything is nice. There's you know there's there's bodily fluids on the floor that you're walking. There's down. a lot of sexuality, in yeah, it. and I think yeah. that's what, that's also it's it's exciting. It's surprising. It's it's the sort of stuff I remember. You know, stories that I liked after I was a kid later on again, like Philip Dick comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 rattling. And I thought that politically the landscape as you mentioned is so many. There are so many different political groups and mm -hmm. factions and yeah. it's a very like li living. Well, there's uh, technology and political groups. Mm -hmm. It like is. You just have to say very they're not separate. No. They're like together. And that's what's like so worrisome. Right. You know, and that's what I mean. That's what comic books did so well. I mean, Jack Kirby mm -hmm. specifically, but other people, too. And it seems even now, I mean, we're we're, we're much more politically uh, active and things are a lot crazier. It feels all the time crazier. So that felt more even more written to the moment. And that, I thought that was interesting. I didn't know if you felt that somehow now it's coming or do you feel oh, like there's the path from celebrity to politics also? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, well, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm just always thinking about it. I think there's a group of people who are always thinking about, well, what's happening next? It's not that we're right or any, any person is right or something like that, but saying, well, what happens? What, what, what naturally comes out of this? And that's what comes, you know, and really the, the brilliance of, of Dick, I don't like Dick's writing. Like, I don't like how he writes words, but his ideas are extraordinary and his characters are real people rather than people who are, you know, Flash Gordon 
You know what I mean? That 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 kind of thing. That or the you know the the captain of you know the enterprise. You know this. It's like yeah yeah yeah. But you know the real guy who's going to make a difference is like you know uh, with with Camus and the plague. It's it's just the normal everyday guy who's going to just going to sit there and he's going to gird himself and he's going to fight for what's right. You know that's that's the world. That's the world we live in. Uh, you know, and it's always been. You know these heroes. I mean John Wayne is fine, but he's not. You know he's an actor. He's not a person. You know what I mean? And, and, and so it's fun to write about those characters and to see where they go and, and, and how they get there and how they represent us getting there. Oh. Do you feel like now, I mean, there, right now we're in, a, we're in a period of time where there are a lot of, a lot of superhero movies, a lot of cyberpunk mm -hmm. uh, stuff set in that genre. I used to read a lot of cyberpunk before. Do you, do you feel like now, do you have any thoughts about like that, that landscape? Is it, is it, has it drifted to becoming too much of a, a genre in and of itself, or when you mentioned like the, the, the grittiness and the reality of, 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 of some of those ideas like that. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing, yeah. right? I mean that, that, you know, the, I, I, I keep on telling people, they say, well, are you going to make another movie? You know, and I'm always trying to make a movie, but, but the thing is I said, well, you know, they just made Black Panther. So that means I have a six to nine month window. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they go, well, what are you talking about? Now everything is different. I said, well, they said that with the Emancipation Proclamation. It, it's not been completely work out that way. And, and then, then they'll, 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 they'll say, but, but everything is different. Now look at all that money that was made. And I said, yes, and who made the money? Disney made the money. And I can promise you the Black Panther doesn't work at Disney. You know, works for Disney, but not at Disney, and certainly is not collecting the big money on top. And that, and and, and that alone, to say I'm identifying my politics with this movie that made all this money for these white people over here, it's like, well, that's 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 really like when you've been bamboozled. That's when you know Spike Lee's movie comes into play, right? It's like, oh, you've been bamboozled, man. This isn't you're 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 paying them. Uh, 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 Mary Baraka once was, 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 he was giving a talk and he said, he said, I used to go down to the corner and listen to jazz. He says, now I got to go to another man's neighborhood and pay him to find out what I got on my own mind. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I think is happening now. That's when the, you know, everything happens at a, at a particular time. I was excited when I, you know, I, I bought the Fantastic Four comic book where it was the first Black Panther, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that, that's the moment. It's not all, you know, 50 years later, yeah. you know. Do, do you think science fiction is, is, a, is an area you'll, you're going to keep wanting to return to, is an area that's always on your mind, or do you feel like it, it comes at, at certain points, or how do you relate to it with the rest it, of your writing? I mean, it depends on what you're trying to say. You know, it, it's, it's like if I'm really trying to understand the structure of the fabric of the universe, I'm not going to write a mystery. Cause that doesn't make sense. You know, if I'm going to try to figure out uh, what the only spiritual thing I have in my head, which is that I believe there is a soul, I'm not going to write, you know, a kind of a literary novel of a, a philosopher thinking about the soul. I'm going to, you know, I want to get to it. So the, in, in those kinds of questions, that's definitely, you know, alternative fiction, speculative fiction. Um, and, you know, when I'm talking more politically, mysteries work very well for politics, you know, and, and, and sort of, you know, literary, not, when I have, you know, intellectual ideas, well, literary fiction fits that very well. And sometimes I just write nonfiction, you know, so I, I believe this. There, there's kind of a little bit of a technology crossover between the science fiction and some of the, some of the detective books, because we're always looking for, for that in the Leonid McGill books. He's got a hacker friend and you start to have some of this uh, interaction with uh, databases and technology and tracking people that you don't get in the Easy Rollins books because it's before right. any, of that, any of that stuff happened. And you see a little bit of it in, 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 in Down the River where there's a lot of, uh, you know, you know you have to take the battery out of the cell phone and ditch it because they're, because they're, because they're tracking you. I'm always struck that these characters are of, of a generation where they kind of have one foot on either side. Mm -hmm. they're, they're comfortable enough engaging with the technology, sometimes with some help in some way, uh, but they're also still in your face, I'm going to go do it in person kind of people. And I feel like uh, we don't see that as often. I feel we're all sort of behind our screens all day long and that person to person communication, even making a phone call mm -hmm. has, has, has gotten lost. And so interesting to see these people uh, uh, who can call their hacker friend or do something that, that's kind of high tech, but then also just bust through the door or bust into an office. Uh, and I think it almost shocks young people now who are so anti-confrontational. Uh, anti 
interrelational. They're happy to confront you. You know, or many Just of from them behind are. the keyboard. Right. But, but I, I saw an episode of Justified where a, a guy had, had used like the marshal's logo to steal this guy's business online. The guy goes to the marshal and the marshal says, that's not us, they misspelled marshal, so obviously it's wrong. And so then, they, 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 but then the, the people who did it, the guy finds somebody and they go to the people who did it and, they, and he said, listen man, you know, it's all on the net, I can't, and then the guy pulls out a gun and points it at his head. I said, that's the moment, right? There's a moment, and when somebody is like pointing a gun at your head, or is going to in the future point a gun at your head, you can say, I really am not trusting this keyboard to protect me. I actually need a living body that's gonna help me, you know, you know, make sure that I don't die. Because the computer is not a mother box, it's not gonna help you not die. It's gonna just sit there and, and you know, when you're dead, it won't even miss you. And so I think that, that even for those people, you know, the things that they're doing online haven't become completely technological. It's not that people are talking about binary. I used to be a computer programmer. I coded programs in, 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 in assembler language, in, in, you know, in binary language or hexadecimal. And uh, that, like, that's a, that was like an amazing thing. And it's still true. Those things still run computers today. Um, nobody talks about that. So all the things they're talking about is sex and violence and uh, anger at something and how you can get away and Bitcoin. And all of it is real. It's real things. It's just uh, people who are, have become a, a bit more effete uh, in, in their dealing with the world. You know? But it's the same stuff. Computer's not going to get you out of that basement. I'm going to be tied up. No, it'll keep you in there. Yeah, that's right. Shoot. You know, and it's, you know, it's an interesting thing, you know, you try to make, people try to make enemies out of technology, but, you know, technology isn't, the enemy, isn't an enemy, and it's also something you can't get away from. That, that was going to be a question I was going to ask you. Do you feel it's, uh, uh, seeing, seeing it put to good and bad in Future Land and other books, is it, a, is it a force for positive change, is it a force for democratization, or is it a force to, you know, keep people, keep people tied up, keep people down? Well, the, answer, the, the question that I would come back with from that is, what is the most sophisticated um, culture in the world? I asked a good friend of mine once, I said, what is, what do you think? He said, oh, the West, you know, they have technology and they have this and that and domination and stuff like that. And, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm kind of partial to the Aborigines in Australia, you know, cause an Aborigine, you know, wearing nothing can walk across uh, like a river with thousands of crocodiles in it and not get eaten because he or she understands that at a certain temperature, crocodiles go to sleep. So if you get into the hottest part of the water, they, they, won't, they won't be able to get at you because they'll fall asleep on the way. And you know, to be, able to, to be able to live in a world like that, to be able to live under the stars, to be able to, to live naturally in the world, we can't. And on top of that, we don't understand what we do have, like air conditioners. I mean, nobody understands air conditioners. Those people, again, they don't, they, they might talk about air conditioning, but they don't understand them. You know, they understand like the meta. They understand uh, the, the, the software that runs the system that gets you to the sexual pictures or, 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 or they, they, un they understand all kinds of stuff that, that is, is not there. Like in, in an air conditioner. So how do you, how, how does an air conditioner work? So, well, you just flip the switch and it comes on. That's a meta notion, right? That's why in every post-apocalyptic book and TV series and movie, the world falls apart completely because no one knows even, you know, if, if they're lucky, they can get some crops going if they get lucky, uh, but they can't figure out how to hook up even like a windmill and, and power a light bulb. Yeah, and it reminds me too, when you talk about technology in, those, in future land, there are these industries and products that again, uh, snake through all the stories mm -hmm. that are referred to as almost their own brand names in and of themselves, like a synth steel or something. And it, it makes me think of that. It's like, you know, oh, it's that thing because we know what that thing is in that world. But you, you sometimes follow it up to who's making it. But even then, it's, it's, it's like another character in the story yeah. that, that people uh, have become dependent on. There's a lot of dependence at all the, all the levels. Yeah, you, I get dependent on it. And, and really, and, and this has been true forever. Like, like, there was a moment along the Nile where the, the, the Egyptians started growing grain. Before they were just gathering it, then they started growing it. And when you follow the graves from 
before that and after, before everybody lived to 80 years old, if they didn't die in childbirth, everybody, you know, they, they, were, they were healthy, there was all these, there was no arthritis, there was no this, no that. But as soon as they start eating that grain, average age death is 35 years old, everybody is obese, everybody has arthritis because they could just eat, 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 you know, and, and, th and those people had to be winnowed out so that you could eat, eat, eat and not get so fat. But like, that's the, that's the, the notion. Technology is always weighing on us, always weighing on us. And, 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 and we're kind of stuck with it. We're stuck with being part of that thing. And of course you, you run the systems. Okay. If, if everything runs itself in the future, everything gets made by, by uh, factories, uh, cars drive themselves, everything is, is, is worked like that, then you have a trouble, you have a conflict between capitalism, which has been mastered technology, and, and, and people working and making money to pay the capitalists the money to make the technology. You know, and you know, we're, we haven't talked about it that much yet, but that's, that's the big problem in the next 50 years. And the enforced escapism, that constant blaring at you, watch this, experience this, plug into this, play this game, watch this movie, watch this TV, it's on your, it's on your phone now, it's everywhere you go, stream everything. Uh, the, 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 the pulse drug in, in Futureland reminded me, and I think Scott too, of we, uh, the last couple of years we've done a lot with virtual reality. It's gotten to, the hardware has gotten to a point where it's a similar experience in that it's putting you in a completely realistic uh, uh, fantasy land where you move and experience it in the same way, and it's very disconcerting. Uh, have you that, that, that feels extra current? Have you tried any of the the current generation I, 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 of VR? I, I went to one place where they they had rides. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. So instead of being and you didn't wear anything actually, it was like there's a it was just the whole room mm -hmm. did it. And you felt like you were moving somewhere, oh, right. okay. and you were it's doing like something, a, yeah, like and, an immersive right? Simulator. And yeah, you felt like you were yes. moving back and forth, and it was—I sure. would get dizzy. But like, but the thing was, yeah, I, I've I've seen that. That's one thing, you know. That's like that pure entertainment notion. But the other things, like in the prisons in Futureland, where you have a thing that you wear that no matter that, that no matter what, you know, if you get too excited, it calms you down. If you if you're sound asleep, it wake, wakes you up. If, if you you know whatever it is, it's going to fix you. And you, you under you understand. I. My understanding of that is once you have it working in the prisons, then you can give it to everybody. You give it to students in school because we know, you know, because we have, you know, uh, standardized education and, you know, we, you give it to people at work so they can work at their, at their best, you know, and it doesn't matter that they don't have offices and everybody's sitting right next to each other. All of this stuff, you know, like becomes a part of the future. And the thing is, if it makes money, it's hard to get rid of it because, we, because our system is not technological, it's capitalism. And capitalism is the person who makes the most profit for the least effort is the person who's going to be in charge, you know? And so that, that I, you know, th that's what you have to wonder about. And I guess you could worry about it. <laughs> it, it you know, it's going to happen. I, if you were worried about something's going to happen, it's very pretty, I think I'm going to die one day. Well, yeah, you are, you know? Yeah. There is yeah, a thing strapped to your wrist one day, and it'll, yeah. I, you have it now. Yeah, though. Almost packs. anyone I mean, who has a, a fitness tracker or a smartwatch basically has a, a has a heart sensor connected to them. It's the very the internet beginnings. Twenty four seven. We should be thankful yes. that it's not as deeply connected. But imagine it can yet. monitor your heart rate, and the new version is there's an Apple working on something where it can tell you if it, it knows well, it already your can heart tell rate. If it had, if even elevated sedentary heart rate, it'll yeah. ping you about that. But the question then is where the data gets collected. Sent how to it your gets insurance used. company. Sent to whoever. Sure like the engines of that but i think the continual observation that is in some of my in my favorite nightmare scenarios in science fiction shows up a lot in future land of um like you were mentioning the the ability to always administer checks and balances um to your body control you continuously and what you can do about that that's that's uh yeah it's very pharmaceutical like, well, and the yeah. thing to, to think about is when does it happen that you need that band to go to work. That becomes a thing. When you need the band to go to work, you can't get in the front door, if you don't have your band on. I mean, Absolutely. and it has to be on. Yeah. You can't be just holding it, it has to be on, you know, and, and, and it's following you every time. And if you disappear, that's a problem. Security is, is, is war. So all of a sudden, uh, because of one thing, your life becomes completely controlled. Because one thing that doesn't seem to be about controlling you, you become controlled and that, that becomes the issue. And, and it is the issue.
It is the issue because the, of, of domination. People get upset. People get upset with me. I never, when I leave my home and I'm just going out somewhere to you know, do things, I always leave my phone at home. I say, I'm going to leave my phone at home. I want to go out in the world. People call and say, where were you? I said, I was out. They said, well, did you have your phone? I said, no, I leave my phone at home when I go out. I have a tremendously hard time. Yes, I think you get a sense and of anxiety when you do that. My, my kid guilts me. Love to. My kid guilts me all the time about it, and he'll he'll notice. But it's something you know. I guess it's uh, to some degree drinking the uh, the the water here and, and testing tech, and, to, and and you start using it all the time, and you have to disconnect from it and develop a routine where you don't fall too deep in it yourself. But that continual. Uh, but the but the problem becomes yeah. the problem with with that is this. You two work together for the same person, let's say, and uh, you know you're at your home. It's two o'clock in the morning. That person needs something at two o'clock in the morning. Yep. He's going to call both of you. Yep. And does if, if, if yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that person. <laughs> and if you answer and he doesn't, yeah, you're ahead. You know, and if you keep answering and he doesn't, and you keep on, you're going to move ahead. And so you're going to have to say, listen, I got to keep my phone right, right next to my head. That happens yeah. as, all the as time. A veteran, as, as, as veterans of early morning uh, TV, TV? Uh, Scott and I run into that all the time. TV yeah. appearance, I had to get two inside the <laughs> Can system. Can come but over at six o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Okay, sure, send a call. <laughs> TV, but, but you know, it's true. And, the, and there's a degree to which you want to, you want to disconnect, but it travels home with you. It's already lights. That immersiveness. Yeah, you want already, to, but you can't. Yeah, you can. I mean, really. I mean, of course, and it's, again, like, but, th okay, that's one thing to think about and, and how it's going to impact people's lives. The other thing is the Industrial Revolution. 12 hours a day, six and a half days a week. You get a half day off on Sunday to go to church. You know, that's because people were working for the company stores. Tennessee Ernie Ford says, you know, you're, they're, they're working for the, co the company store. It doesn't matter who you are, or what you are, or what you feel, you know? And that becomes the moment where the interface with technology is, you know, and it's, and that moment has always existed since the ancient Egyptians. It's all, we're always running up against that wall. The thing is that people, th you know, people always think they're different. They always, they just think they're different. And, and, and really, I, and just to say, and, and the other thing that I, the next thing I would write about if I, if I yeah. can figure it out in, in science fiction, um, you know, up until World War I, knowledge doubled every century, all the way back, knowledge doubled. So you have three, four generations in the same culture technological culture, which mean, which is our culture. And then all of a sudden World War I had doubled and then it moved up a little faster and then World War II happened even faster. Now knowledge doubles every 10 months, right? And th that means, you know, it used to be that kids would say to their parents, you don't know what you're talking about. And then they would go out in the world. 10 years later, they come back and say, well, you know, you were right. I found out that what you said is the right thing. Now they say, you don't know what you're talking about. And they go out in the world. And 10 years later, the parent says, you know, my kid told me I didn't right. know, but they were right. Because yep. knowledge is changing so fast that you can't keep up. Nobody can keep up. And that, that is really, it's like an, it's like an insidious enemy. It's, it's like, you know, the, inf the economic infrastructure or the unconscious or evolution. You know, it's like all of those things. They're there and they're changing you and you don't know it. As two people that in the keeping the up time. industry, I, I think we, we totally feel the burden of that well, all the and time. With, and with kids, yeah, we're, we're, I already feel the, at this point, or watching what he does on his own, he'll accelerate past, even though I follow tech all the time, or think I do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, all of a sudden he'll be ahead in some area, like programming, for instance, where he'll just sort of teach himself and, and play around with things. I mean, it, to some degree, it does feel like an acceleration through the technology that we use. And that's... Yeah. Well, it's always so. It's yeah. always, it always is. And that, yeah. that's the thing. It's like the thing to, if I, if you can connect this with the ancient Egyptian, then, then you begin to understand what it is to be human. You know, if you always think, and of course it's hard to look at the past because you look through the lens of the current technology. So it's really hard to understand other technologies that people are living under, but it, so that way they're different in that way, but they're the same as far as impacting how your life is organized how your, your, your relationship to children, your, your relationship to, to gender, your relationship to everything gets changed by how your technology works. And that, that's really, and it's always been true. Have you wanted to write anything that dives even further back in history to look like it again with that lens of the present on a period of time? Well, you know, I have this book coming out in uh, September called uh, John Woman. And it's, it's, a, it's a novel about a deconstructionist historian. I, I, I believe that history is the only true deconstructionist art because you can never know history. 
it's always it's always going to change. It's it's going to change. Was in, that was even in, in Future Land. I feel like that was yeah. The, that, yeah that's yeah. exactly what their father had brought up. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can't know it. You can't yeah. understand. So 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 like and and right now that 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 and that's a technolog it's a technological thing, you know. Though it's all all in your head. And you know, Chris, that's the other like like really like the thing about Einstein. I mean, he just made that shit up. I mean. He just made it up. I mean, it's just like, well, you know, I was thinking that uh, space might be different here and, and you know, in, in the upper atmosphere. So I'm going to have to refute Newton and just say, but really, he, he didn't do any calculations. He didn't have a laboratory and he just did all this stuff. The, the, the gorgeous thing about the, the, the human mind is, is that moment, you know, lack of, just, of sudden awareness, you know, which usually comes, I think, from some kind of mental illness. Mental illness is always helps us to do better, or often helps us to do better in society, you know, and, and at the same time, it doesn't help us do better in, in human relations. Would you, <laughs> do you have a question? That seems like a great place <laughs> to, a good uh, spot to wrap up. Yes. Yes. Um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of this. Like I, I, and I actually want to read a lot more of your crime and mystery novels which mm -hmm. is an area that i've never been mm -hmm. a reader of, of a lot of like uh, mystery uh stories but it's, it's I read a lot of i've torn through so many of them so quickly i started with elmore leonard and mm -hmm. then i got it to you and i started reading richard price mm -hmm. and and that's kind of my my yeah. triumvirate of of of, of crime novels that's uh, the area uh, also... it's a gray area for me like i don't i don't know I, yeah in terms of writers in the genre i need to catch up you know and, and I highly recommend, of course, Down the River, Unto the Sea, which I just finished and is also great, a great New York uh, detective novel. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much. Thank Glad you so to be much. Here. Thanks for joining us on CNET Book Club. If you've liked today's book or any of Walter Mosley's books, uh, leave us a comment or a note or a tweet. Or if you have a book you'd like us to talk about or an author you'd like us to talk to, let us know. I'm Dan Ackerman for Scott Stein. Thanks for joining us.